Hello everyone and welcome back to Programming and Access 2013, the advanced course. My name is Steve Bishop and in today's video we're going to be doing a demonstration of using a web API to access JSON and XML data. So uh, this is going to be a low level demonstration of the actual interaction with a web API to retrieve that JSON and XML data. It is not going to be using any sort of access uh, coding language just yet. We're going to do that in the next video. I just kind of want to show you some of the more low level uh, dealings with a web API to see what's actually kind of going on behind the scenes with a web API and how we're supposed to be interacting with that API on a very uh, much more lower level. Okay, so let's go ahead and hop out here and I want to show you, first of all, kind of the code that I've got going on on the back end that is our web API that we're going to be interacting with. So this is the service that some providers are going to have. Okay, This is a service that I've created. You're not going to have to go through and create this at all. Um, this is just kind of a demonstration of some sort of theoretical um, web API that's going to supposedly already exist out there in the wild and you're going to want to go and interact with it in some way. But I want to show you what's going on behind the scenes with that web API just a little bit so you can kind of gain a little bit better of an understanding of what's happening behind the scenes and, and why it all works. So I've got um, my Visual Studio, uh, my Microsoft Visual Studio uh, IDE open here. And for those of you who don't, don't know what Visual Studio is, it's a development environment uh, that's really specifically designed for uh, .NET framework developers. So if you're developing a C-sharp application, a VB.NET application, an ASP or an ASP.NET, uh, or you know, typically anything in the .NET framework realm, you're going to be wanting to do that development through Visual Studio. Uh, you can also do development for things like PHP, JavaScript, uh, and really any HTML document if you wanted to. So it's not limited to just the .NET framework. You can do other types of programming languages in it, but it really is designed to be very useful for the .NET framework. So I have a project on here called Sample API. And in my Sample API, I have a contacts uh, class object. Now this is written in C sharp, so I don't expect you to really fully understand what's going on here with this. This is a completely different language than what we've been dealing with with VBA. Okay, this is not Visual Basic for applications. This is C sharp, which is a .NET framework language. So, um, but there are some similarities here. I think that you'll understand. For example, we have a class object called Contact. Now, if you went through my basic course. Uh, in VBA, you'll know that a class object has properties and methods on it. Well, a class object, this particular class object in C Sharp, is called contact, and it has properties on it. It has a ID property, which is an int. It's a type of int property. I have a string property called first name. I have another string property called middle name. I have another string property called last name. And then finally, I have another string property called email. So my class object here is pretty simple. It's got an ID, a first name, a middle name, a last name, and an email. These are all properties that belong to a contact. Okay, pretty straightforward. We've already seen this example, like I said, in VBA. This is just a slightly different way to code that. Okay, but it's the same concept. So I have a contact object, right? I also have something called uh, a controller and in this case I've named it contacts controller now in web API's a controller is essentially a landing spot for your requests so if I have a uh, say a web browser that tries to go to this contacts URL on my website um, this is essentially where it's going to land where that request is going to land it's going to come to this contacts controller and um, I don't know if you uh, if you recall in the last video, I said something, uh, I used the term um, convention over configuration. Well, it turns out that with Web API, the simple fact that I've named this controller contacts controller is actually all that I need in order to indicate that this should be the landing spot for that URL. So I don't have to do a whole bunch of uh, configurations in order to make this the code 
that is going to handle that request. Instead, just simply the fact that I've named it context controller is all I need so that if I go to the contacts URL, I'm going to land here. Now you'll see on my controller, I have a few different methods. So this class object called it called contacts controller has a few different methods. One of them is called get, okay? And the other one here is called post. And if you recall in the last video, get and post were two of the action verbs that we could use when accessing a URL or making a request to a URL. Um, so get and post are two different action verbs that if I go to this contacts URL using the get action, then I'm going to run this code on my API. If I issue a post request or a post action verb to my contacts URL, then this code will run. Okay. And again, I know you guys are probably not you know, not efficiently, uh, you, know, you don't know C sharp very well, so I'm not going to give you a whole rundown of how this all works, but just give you kind of a general concept here. Um, again, if you've seen the basics course for VBA, this is actually probably not going to be too foreign to you. It's just that it's written a little differently in C sharp. Here we have a for loop, right? A for loop that just has an initial starting value for the, va uh, the variable i of 1, and then as long as i is less than or equal to 20, it's going to run whatever is here inside of this scope. It's going to run this code. And after each time that it runs this code, uh, this is a little different in C sharp. This means, uh, I++ means add 1 to the value of i. So i gets increased by one time. Okay, so and, and then as long as i is still less than or equal to 20, it's going to go ahead and run this code again. So essentially we're saying um, run this code 20 times. Okay, and for each time, the value of i is going to get increased by 1. And then we're assigning the values. You can see here we have, uh, this is a new contact. This is the name of my object. It's a type of contact. Remember, that's that class object that we that I showed you just a few minutes ago. I have a contact object called new contact, which is a new contact type. Okay, and on this new contact, I'm setting the property value of ID equal to whatever the value of I is at the time, and then kind of the same thing with first name. I went ahead and named it first, and then whatever the value of I is, and then middle name. We're concatenating middle with the value of i, last name, we're concatenating the word last to whatever the value of i is, and then email is kind of the same thing. And then at the end here, we're adding new contact, that new contact that we just created, to a collection of contacts, okay? Or you could think of this as a dictionary or a collection that we would use in VBA. We've done that also in the basic series. We've, we've done collections. So we have a collection of contacts that's going to contain all of the contacts that we generate using this code here, okay? Now, after it's done creating those 20 new contacts, this return OK contacts. OK is a method um, that exists in the .NET framework. I believe it's under the uh, system web HTTP namespace. Don't worry about that. That's probably all very foreign to you. <laughs> it's okay. All you have to understand is OK is a method that returns back a 200. Um, now, 200 in HTTP protocol means everything is just okie dokie. There were no problems processing requests. Everything went splendidly, and you're good to go. So OK method returns back that 200 back to the user, whoever the consumer is of my web API, but it's also going to pass along the contacts collection, this contacts collection that I've added my new contacts to each time. That collection of objects is going to get passed back to the user as well. So this is going to be what we call the body of the response. Okay, The contacts collection is going to actually come back to the user uh, as part of the body of the response. Down here we have on our post method, uh, or you can consider this the action verb, um, we just have one contact being built. 
And that one contact, you'll see with my post method, I actually have to pass in a, a parameter of ID. So um, when I'm issuing this post request or post action method on my web API, I need to pass it in an ID value. And I'll show you how to do that uh, when we get to that part. But you'll see that the contact, new contact gets built. And again, the properties are being set based upon whatever I pass in as that parameter. So the ID value for my new contact is going to equal whatever the parameter it value is that I passed in. Uh, same thing with first name. Again, I'm concatenating first with whatever the value is that I pass in as that parameter. And same thing with middle, last, and email. And then of course, we've got our okay method that's going to turn and say, everything's hunky-dunky, okay, everything's good, you're good to go, and here's the actual value back to your, uh, as the content. It's going to contain those values that I set on my new contact. So there you go. There's some of the inner workings of what my web API is doing. Nothing too special, nothing really complex. We just have two methods, a get method and a post method that are, uh, that is going to be responded to. Okay. So let's go ahead and, uh, spin this baby up. So I'm just going to go ahead and start it up. And now my web service is running. And initially, this is not going to the right location. I need to point this to the correct URL. And the URL is API forward slash contacts. Okay. Now, don't have to worry about this. You're not going to need to concern yourself with this. This type of information, what the URL has to be, and, and you know, if there's some sort of API directory, you know, all this information, you're going to need to work out with whoever that third party vendor is that is exposing the web API. But in our example, and the way that I've set up my web API, in order for me to get to that contacts controller, all I have to do is go to this URL of the host, the host name, which is localhost, and it's running on this special port 55834. And there's a directory called API. And then on that, I have a, a controller called contacts. And if you look down here, I actually have right here, IIS Express is the service that's hosting my website. Uh, you can see I have sample API is the project that's running and there it's running at localhost uh, 55834. And I just need to put this forward slash API in context in order to land at this contracts controller. OK, so that's where we have that whole naming, uh, the convention over configuration. Um, you can see, oops, that's not where I wanted to go. Uh, just the simple fact that I put contact in here uh, as the URL I want to land to or I want to go to. It's going to land here at this contacts controller API. So if I go ahead and issue this request, I'm just going to go ahead and hit enter. Now, by default, whoops. Um, Come on now, let's go. There we go. Uh, by default, um, just simply putting in an address up here in the URL like this is going to issue a get request. So this contacts re um, request is going to land at this get method here. And because of that, you can see the data is coming back. ID one, first name one, middle name one, last name, last one, email is first one at domain one.com. And you can see we've got all the way up to 20 of these. So you can see my last uh, JavaScript object notated object here is ID 20, first name 20, middle name mid middle 20, last name is last 20, email is first 20 at domain 20.com. So this you can see is returning back when I go to that URL some JSON, okay? This is the JavaScript object notation. Now you'll see there's no indentation. Uh, it's not beautified in any way. It's It's got rid of all of the extra spaces and that's because um, with JSON, because it, uh, it's trying to eliminate all of the extra data that it might be trying to transmit. And every time you put a space or a tab um, in your response, that's an extra character that's unnecessary. So JSON has eliminated all of those extra spaces. Okay, so this is what you would typically get back from JavaScript object notation in its raw form. It's just this, okay? 
Now, I'm going to take the same URL, I'm just going to copy it here, and I'm going to go to Google, uh, Google Chrome. And I'm going to paste it here. And you'll see that kind of ironically here, we get XML. This is the same data, but it's in XML form. Um, and I say that's ironic because it's kind of funny to me that XML is typically uh, a Microsoft, uh, you know, how Microsoft displays data. It's kind of how, you know, Microsoft applications are designed to return beta, data back is through XML. Um, yet I go to Chrome, which is a more, uh, you know, it's an Android or, or Google product. And uh, when I go to a website, it gives me back XML. Whereas here, if I go through uh, Edge browser, which is a Microsoft uh, product, I get JSON, which is the more, um, you know, um, community-based version of how you're supposed to receive data. So it just seems a little funny to me that Microsoft, when you use a Microsoft product to access an, a web a API, the default comes back uh, community-based. But when you, uh, by default, use Google Chrome in order to go to that same web API, it comes back as a Microsoft uh, construct of, of how data gets responded back. So anyway, just kind of a little ironic there. But you'll see that we have the same data is being displayed in the two different formats. We've got JSON here, and we've got XML here. And again, um, the JSON is formatted so that we have ID is the uh, attribute name with a value of one, and then first name is the attribute name, and then it's a value of first one, and middle name, et cetera, et cetera. And then of course, if we look at the XML, we can see here is a contact, with a beginning and ending tag. And inside of it, we have our email address, we have our first name, we have our ID, we have our last name, and we have our middle name that all comprise the properties of our contact object. So there you go, there is the XML response back and here is the JSON response back. So how do uh, you get one or the other? How, since these are both going to the same location, right? They're still both pulling up the same URL. Um, and they're both issuing this get request to our web API. How is it that one is getting one back and the other is getting a different version back? Well, it actually has everything to do with how the request is formatted. So I'm going to copy the URL here. And I'm going to go to this little product called Fiddler. And in Fiddler, you'll see I have uh, as part of a composer, let me just clear out some of this stuff here. Uh, on my composer tab here, I can actually compose a request to a web service. So I'm going to go ahead and paste that same URL. I'm going to do a get request, and I'm going to leave everything else just as it is. And I'm going to go ahead and hit execute. And when I hit execute, I get back a result. And if I double click on this, you'll see that I get back a JSON result. So I see if I click on the JSON tab here to view my results, I get a JSON object back that has, a, you know, the nice thing about Fiddler is it formats everything for you. So you, you don't get all the blank spaces. You can actually see all the tabs and stuff that it should be in. It pre-formats it for you. So here we've got email, first name, ID, last name, middle name, and all the way down, of course, one through 20. Now, if I go back up to the composer, and let's say I want this to be XML. Well, it turns out this part right here is very, very important. These are what we call request headers, okay, or just headers. So every time that you issue a request to, uh, to a web service, you have certain headers on it. In this case, just by default, we have what is the user agent, and what is the host that we're making a request to. There's also other headers that you can add to this. So you can specify a lot of different things that you want as part of your request to the URL or to the web service. And one of those headers is accept. And when you say accept, you can pass in a variety of what we call different media types. What is the media type that we want to use? And if you go about the internet and you try to look up what the different media types are, you'll find that there are a couple of them that are very important to uh, uh, for this specific example. And if I do application JSON as my accept header, 
and I execute it, I will get back JSON. So you can see the JSON tab, and once again, there's all of my results. But I can change my request from accept JSON to accept, accept XML. And if I execute this same request, again, I'm doing a get action verb on my contacts URL, and I execute this, all I did was change the application, uh, the accept header to application XML. And if I open up the response back, you'll see that it comes back in the form of XML. So by default, what it turns out that happens when uh, the Edge browser makes a request or even Internet Explorer is that it doesn't pass along any sort of accept header. But by default, Google Chrome does have an accept header, uh, and that accept header is application XML. So that's why Google Chrome responds back with XML, and uh, the Edge browser returns back JSON because uh, it doesn't have one, and by default, JSON is what Web API is configured to return back. So that's how you can compose your request. So we're looking at the low-level request, the actual text, uh, the headers, the URL, and the action method that gets sent to our Web API to make a request. Now, there was one other thing, one other method that we had on here, which was the post method. And the post method requires an ID. Well, as it turns out, as part of my web API, there's something called routing, and I'm not going to get into it too much, but it makes this very simple to pass in what the ID value is. Um, you can do it one of two ways. You can either do just simply a forward slash, and I'll pass in a value of, say, 88, okay? And I'm going to set my accept to JSON, so application slash JSON. If I just go ahead and change this action verb from get to post and execute this, you'll see that I get back my 200, which was because of that OK function. And if I open this up, you'll see there is my first 88, domain 88, first name, first 88. ID is 88, last name is last 88, middle name is middle 88. So all I had to do in order to send in the extra parameter of what that ID value is, the way that I have my web ABI API configured, all I have to do is pass in, oops, I go to my, go to Fiddler here. I just have to pass in a forward slash and then whatever I want that value of that parameter to be. But what if, uh, what if I didn't have it set up that way? Well, a lot of times, and you've probably seen this in many query strings before, you've seen something like this. Uh, ID equals 88. So this is perfectly acceptable too. I'm passing in, uh, after a question mark, I'm actually specifying parameters. And I could go on and add more parameters here if I wanted to, if my uh, post method accepted other ones, right? So if I had like name equals Steve, right? I could pass on multiple parameters after this uh, question mark. But in this particular example, I only need the one parameter. So we're, we're, we'll go ahead and delete that. And we'll change it from 88 to, uh, say, 55. Okay? And this time I'm going to change the uh, application JSON to application XML. And go ahead and hit Execute. And you can see, once again, I've returned back a 200. And if I open this up, I've received it in XML language. That's why the XML tab is open here on Fiddler. And we see that the values, of course, have changed to 55. And that's how all of this works. So just wanted to show you that um, the main things you need to understand is that the URL is going to comprise of some of the information you're trying to pass to the web app application. The method that you send, the action verb, that you send is very important, right? So get, post, put, delete, and you can see there's a whole bunch of different uh, ones that are available to you. And in fact, um, it's actually, you can make your own if you really felt like it. <laughs> uh, but these are all different um, action verbs that you can use. Get and post, put, and delete are of course the most common. Um, so the combination of the URL that you pass in, along with any parameters that you might pass in in the URL, the method 
or the uh, action verb that you use is very important to your request. And then finally, any sort of uh, request headers will also be important to send along to the web API. Those are really the important things that you need to understand when you're making a request to some sort of web API uh, or any API really for that matter. They're going to need to know this information. And again, to know which, uh, which of these different things is available and how to actually utilize the service that's being a, that's, that you're trying to interact with, you will need to contact that vendor or find the documentation that that vendor makes available and read through it and try to understand what their requirements are. But this should give you a good demonstration uh, uh, and understanding of all of the things that are happening to do that interaction with that third-party API. And I hope this has been a, a really useful uh, you know, demonstration of how all of these things, all these different components work together in order to go out and retrieve the data. In the next video, we're actually going to start utilizing some of this information in our Access application to do some pretty neat things. So hope to see you there.